Well, it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, I have to tell that arrow story. So uh, he said, I got a call from his secretary, and he said, you didn't hand in the paper at the end of this course on general equilibrium theory. And obviously his secretary had lost it. And so I <clears throat> fortunately had a copy, <laughs> learned a lesson. And I, I took it in, and she said, oh, I'll give it to Professor Arrow. So I went in and sat there. And he took the paper out and went like this, and I thought, this is a disgrace. He's not reading it. And then he started asking me questions about it. <laughs> uh, the, the, the other Arrow story is <clears throat> he was, he's a, a, just a brilliant, broad thinker in a way that very, very few people are. But, uh, but he, has, he can multitask. And so when young people would come to give seminars as part of the job market search, he'd read the paper. And I can remember many occasions in which, you know, this, a young person would literally fall apart with Ken Arrow, apparently not listening to the lecture, you know. And then, of course, after a 35-minute presentation, Arrow's hand would shoot up and he'd say, and ask a question about what was this going on, and everybody thought he wasn't paying attention. Anyway. Um, it's more fun for you and me if at any point in this, and I'm not going to try to get through all this, why don't you just butt in and make comments or ask questions or, rather than just have me stand here and talk, okay? Just stick up your hand and we'll go. I, I, I've spent the last 10 years of my life thinking about growth in one form or another. And, <clears throat> and the early part of that period and a continuing interest is developing country growth. Uh, and so, uh, I chaired a commission on growth and development. Most of the people in that commission were people who had leadership positions in economic policy, finance, or the, the political people. So I learned a ton from them because they had fought these battles and won and lost. The only two academics were Bob Solo, who actually knew something about growth, and me, uh, who didn't. And so I want to talk a bit about that and then, and then kind of edge into the post-crisis period and talk about growth dynamics in in a variety of places. I do spend a fair amount of time in China and try to be helpful when they have issues that they think international experience or expertise or both is relevant. And if you're interested, I'll spend some time on that. I wrote this book called The Next Convergence, and, and it's basically uh, about growth. It's about the developing country growth. And so, this, uh, what, and so the story, I had a, I had a uh, agent that, uh, that Paul Collier put me in touch with. His name is Andrew Wiley. Uh, I'm the least well-known person he ever dealt with. You know, these people are people like Philip Roth and whatnot, actually serious writers. And uh, <clears throat> he took me on, regrettably for him. And uh, so I said, well, you know, the developing world's kind of like a mosaic. It's really interesting. And he said, well, it won't be for most people. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, if you're going to write a book for anything other than your three friends in economics, then you've got to tell a story. So I went away and thought about that. And I said, there is a story. And so this is, the story is that for much of the history of the world, uh, lots of interesting things happened, but one of them wasn't growth. Uh, and this is now pretty well known as a result of the work of Ag uh, Angus Madison. And so we started to see growth in the 18th century. <coughs> That's the start of the British Industrial Revolution that, that spread throughout Europe first and then uh, across the Atlantic and eventually got to Australia and New Zealand. Uh, but you can see this pattern, and I don't know what the 21st century is going to look like, and I don't think I'll see the end of it myself. Uh, so, and this, so this is the first time we had uh, the uh, breaking of the Malthus, Malthus effect, right? Growth wasn't used up by population growth and, and income started to rise. And there's thousands and thousands of books written about this and I don't have anything additional to contribute to that but except to note that it literally stopped at what we now call the boundaries of the advanced countries or industrialized countries or whatever term you want to use. And then it went on for 200 years, and the growth wasn't breathtaking. It was maybe one and a half, one and three quarters percent in real terms in Britain, maybe two to two and a half in continental Europe in the United States. I mean, this is not high growth by 
post-war standards in developing countries, but it was a long time. And so at the end of that period, when I was born in World War II, you know, you basically had a world that was divided into two parts. One part had enjoyed this, whatever this experience was, and the early parts were pretty tough in cities, and the other was pretty much where they were before, except there were a few cars and buses and trains running through. And then that pattern broke. All right, so that, that you can call that divergence, and it broke after World War II, although it was almost impossible to see it at the time because there's a lot of stumbling around associated with, with growth starting. But eventually, for reasons that I think are pretty easy to understand, the developing countries started to grow. And the, and the reasons are basically three. After World War II, the leaders in the world set out, notwithstanding the Cold War, to create an environment that was very different than after World War I. World War I was rightly viewed as a catastrophe. You know, uh, punish the vanquished, you know, crush, etc. And it led to everything everybody knows about. Uh, national socialism, a depression, I mean, it was a disaster. And so they didn't want to do that, and uh, so for, uh, item one was German, Austrian, Japanese recovery. That's where the World Bank came from. And a second very important item was the GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, which essentially was designed to dismantle all the protectionist measures that had been stuck, that were already there, but stuck up even higher in, at the, in, during the Great Depression, thanks to the American policies. And it was brilliant. Uh, then you had the colonial empires with all the built-in asymmetries literally fall apart uh, and go away. Now that left an awful shambles in lots of places, including much of Africa, but nevertheless, that fundamental structure you know, disappeared, and then you had this cascading se sequence of technological tailwinds, uh, you know, transportation costs, airplanes, you know, telecom, ICT, communications, and so on. And it created an environment uh, in which the developing countries could conceivably grow. And grow they did. So they grew at astonishing rates. So we found in the Growth Commission 13 countries that grew at 7% or more a year. That's doubling every decade uh, for 25 years or more. And that just, ne and that's never been seen before. So one question you might ask yourself is, well, how do you do that? <laughs> why, why do you see growth at those rates? And at that stage of development, you know, uh, meaning, uh, so what are we talking about here? Let me just kind of frame it. If you looked at the world in 1950, you know, with Latin America being something of an exception, you know, Argentina actually in the early part of the 20th century had a higher per capita income than China, than Canada, where I grew up, uh, and so on. But for the most part, you know, Africa, Asia, these are countries with per capita incomes of, you know, two or three hundred dollars, less than a dollar a day average. Uh, this is more like the, you know, the pre-British pre Industrial Revolution. Uh, and so when these countries start to grow, you know, they have to grow for a long, long time to get that, you know, they got to double and double and double and double and double again before you get to 10,000 in your, you know, kind of a, what we call middle, high middle income. And, and that's actually what happened. It didn't happen immediately in all countries. Uh, and so a lot of us who, kind of want to spend time thinking about this, you know, think about what was going on. But the basic, but the basic building blocks are pretty clear. And, the, and the, the fundamental one is this divergence, right? So this high speed growth is called catch up growth because, because economies grow at least in part because they're learning how to new, do new things. That's, that's sometimes called technology, it's sometimes called know-how, it's sometimes called whatever. Uh, but it is the most important intangible asset. Some, some of it's embodied in people, some of it's embodied in institutions, you know, and processes and systems that work. And we don't describe it very well, and we don't measure it very well. And because you don't measure it very well, you tend to ignore it a little bit. But I was asked the following question, so I'll ask it to you. If you had the following draconian choice, <clears throat> which was 
substantial war-induced destruction of the physical infrastructure of an economy. That's option one. And two, amnesia, so you forgot everything you knew how to do. <clears throat> Complete amnesia. None of the institutions could function. None of the people could remember how to do things. Which would you choose? One. Yeah. I, I mean, I have everybody would choose one, even the, because you can build that stuff again. It's not fun, <laughs> but it's a whole lot better than not being able to remember how to do all this stuff. And so that's the core. So what happens in a high-speed developing country is that that through multiple channels, essentially, what we learned to do over 200 years, they started to learn to do in their own way, uh, and 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 that works. The two other critical pieces of this are <clears throat> the global economy. So <clears throat> if you have an economy with a per capita income of three or four hundred dollars, it doesn't matter how many people you are, you'll be small <laughs> in the global economy, right? Even if you have 1.3 billion people, you go back to 30 years and ask yourself, what fraction of the global economy was China, you know, when it was coming out of this long period of economic and other kinds of mismanagement before the reforms of Deng Xiaoping, it was tiny. If you isolate that e economy and say, now how fast can it grow? The answer is, it can't grow very fast. The economy consists of, on the <coughs> demand side, of housing, mostly food, subsistence, getting by, right? Now, think of the growth engines <laughs> that drive these economies in an open global economy. None of them are there. You develop, you know, an ability to serve some component of that demand, it's tiny. It's downward sloping, you hit a wall. And then you have to learn how to do another one a little bit better, and then you hit that wall. In the global economy, you find one or two things that you really know how to do. This has been known since Adam Smith. You know, this is specialization, you know, and, and comparative advantage. But, but the point that people didn't realize is, I think, or didn't completely internalize, because most theory is about advanced countries, is that when you're small, you never turn the terms of trade against yourself. You can just grow and grow and grow, right? So you find something that you're comparatively good at that you can sell in the global economy, and then until you get to China's scale, you can just keep doing it. So that's component two, a gigantic market that doesn't limit your growth. And then I want you, I want you to remember that point because I'm going to come back to it under the heading of advanced countries. And the third is you have to invest at very high levels. Now this is the hard part, right? So you can't do this by just sort of, you know, importing technology. You have to build the stuff that enables you to do it. And high levels means above 25% of GDP, as best we can tell. That is not a theoretical conclusion. And of that 25%, five to seven has to be public sector investment. That is infrastructure, education, stuff like that, that increases the return to private investment, domestic and foreign, that drives this, this process. Now, you say, well, those are just numbers. I don't think anybody in this room has lived in a country where the per capita income was $400. But if you invest, 30% of it, save and invest 30% of it, then you've got about $260 left over for daily living. This is an amazing intergenerational choice at that level of income. Now think of the, what we've done in many of our economies. You know, borrow against the future to increase our consumption now, underinvest, America is the most guilty party. Don't save, underinvest and don't save enough to cover your investment. I mean, think of the intergenerational choices that we're making relative to what the successful high growth countries do. I'll just leave you with that, but um, <clears throat> it's, uh, I think, an important lesson. Anyway, so this process that now, this high speed growth process is running. Uh, this is my favorite graph. I, I don't know where it came from originally, but I think it came from Bob Vogel uh, in an article in the journal Political Economy. This is a picture of the population of the world. And uh, for most of that period, the, the per capita incomes were going up, so 
any increase in productive capability got used up in more people. There were plagues, there was all kinds of stuff. And then we're clearly in a, a, just a completely different pattern here. I won't dwell on this, but th this is my way of describing divergence and convergence. So in 1820, 10% of the world's measured income inequality was the result of inter-country differences. They weren't big. You know, the Ming Dynasty per capita income was a little higher than continental Europe, but by and large, it was all the same. Uh, and then it rose and rose and rose. Uh, and this is, this is just what I said before. This is, you know, the advanced countries now about a billion people, then less, you know, going off on their own. And that by the you get time you get to the, just after World War II, the measured income inequality is 60% inter-country differences. And then the developing countries join the party, slowly, haltingly, uh, at first, and then this pattern starts to shift. And now I think what you'll see is the, even though there's rising inequality in many countries intra-country, that, that this thing will start to fall. This is what converge. If, if, if the convergence proposition is right, that we're 60 years into a century-long process where, they, where a very large fraction of the world's population ends up in advanced countries, then that, that is the convergence process. If the global economy survives, it'll be three or four times as big as it is now, and there are real questions about that. But if we figure out a way to solve that problem, then our children and grandchildren, this is one of the most amazing things that you know one could ever imagine happening. People who lived at or near starvation levels, you know, all of a sudden having an opportunity to live like us. And it's not really growth. It, what it really is is expanded opportunity. It's health and education and the chance to be productively employed and the chance to be creative and a whole lot of other things that human beings care about. Um, so I'm rather glad that I got to see in my lifetime at least the, the first part of this, this process. I think it's extraordinary. And there's lots of hard things about it. There's lots of things that you know, create frictions. That, you know, our world is moving around at us, on us pretty fast. Um, here are the 13 countries. The first one was Japan, and almost simultaneously was Brazil. Uh, so Japan was a little bit of a hybrid. It was a middle-income country and war, rec and war recovery as well. Uh, most of the Asian economies are in one form or another used Japan as a model. Korea, quite explicitly South Korea. Uh, they're not all in Asia, although Asia is prominent in there. Uh, I used to say that India and Vietnam were on the way to joining this group and maybe some others. Um, there is a pattern, of widespread pattern of growth in the developing world. It goes up and down a bit. You know, with the tapering announcement produced a rush of capital out of the developing countries and the ones who were running current account deficits, you know, kind of were sucking for air. Uh, and had credit tightening and other things were scrambling around to kind of figure it out. But on the whole, the, the one of the things that's happened in the developing world is that there's real learning. I mean, the macroeconomic management is really just stunningly much better than it was 20 or 25 years ago. And that's learning from experience and learning from global experience uh, from, from us and each other. When I was um, going around to, Talking about this book, uh, the most com in America, I felt like a politician. It's the first time I ever felt like a politician. So I was going to little bookstores and very nice people who were concerned and didn't really know much about what was going on out there. But you know, had a sense of it. Uh, Listen to this and and you know, and then ask questions. So it's really quite a rewarding experience. And the most common question I got asked in one form or another was, "If they win, do we lose?" And the answer to that, I think, is interesting. So the obvious answer that an economist would flip off is, of course not. Um, it's not a zero-sum game. Uh, and in fact, I think the, uh, by and large, sort of people kind of understand that. They, but the political systems, you know, when they need an explanation for why you've lost your job or something, tend to blame, you know, somebody out there. And China's a convenient um, person to blame. Uh, uh, in America, I said, look, 
you know, zero, one thing that is a zero-sum game is market share, right? And we are losing market share, and that's a good thing. So if you're asking, are we, do we lose in the sense of being dominant and losing market share, the answer is yes. And you, you can stop worrying about it because it's already going to happen. Uh, but I said, does it mean that, you know, you're done in? You know, I mean, if you project out to another 30 years, the, the future economic giants are China and India. You know, United States position in the global economy would be more like Germany's is now or Japan's. Um, but it doesn't mean we won't be a highly dynamic economy. Uh, and you can say the same thing about a lot of countries, provided that global economy is put together pretty well and everybody's on their game. Yeah. Professor, sorry for interrupting, but could I just, um, as regards do we lose, okay, in aggregate, and take the example of the US, you might say that the US won't lose out. No. But you have two, two sort of related issues going on in the US. You have a very large uh, cohort of society who haven't had a real increase in income a long time, and you've had an increase, I think, in inequality of income within yep. the US, yep. and possibly in other developed countries. So, uh, do we lose out? Well, maybe you could argue you could get to a stage where a large group of Americans might lose out, or even a majority of them, <coughs> particularly if you have uh, increasing inequality of income. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Those are powerful forces. So now that you've asked the question, I'll just hop uh, forward quite a long way. Sorry. <laughs> so I got concerned about this in the post-crisis period, and this is really what led me uh, to start thinking about advanced countries and sort of growth. And we were talking about it, uh, you know, at lunch. Uh, so we've obviously made mistakes. This is this is the advanced countries uh, trending up to 100 plus percent of uh, sovereign debt to GDP ratios. That's well known. What's not well known is that the developing world, including the low-income countries, are trending down to 40 percent. Uh, so this is just a, a different set of choices related to the intertemporal choices. Now this came from bitter learning from past experience and crises. And uh, for those of you who know this economic history, the, the, the crisis that really produced the maximum amount of learning was the 97-98 crisis that emanated out of Asia. Uh, I'll come back to this. Oh, this, by the way, is Federal Reserve's balance sheet, the United States Central Bank. <clears throat> it's a little scary, isn't it? And if we default on our debt and the interest rates go up, they'll have to accelerate this. <laughs> yeah. Can you ask why it's scary? It's scary because we're in uncharted territory. Nobody knows what the limits to this are. It's possible. It's just that if you don't know whether there is one, and nobody can give a coherent account of what, there are clearly limits to sovereign debt because at some point you can't pay it back, okay? So if this is, and this is not, this is pretty much all now sovereign debt, uh, excuse me, uh, it's not. This is the sovereign debt part, and then, sorry, this is the sovereign debt, and these are mortgage-backed securities. So they're trying to, they're trying to, you know, make the housing market recover. Uh, but, so the answer is, nobody knows. Uh, so it may not be scary once we've kind of figured it out. My, my version of this is the, the issue really is sovereign debt. And this is just a particularly interesting way of controlling prices. Now price controls are fine in the short run if they have a, a targeted purpose. Pursued too long or in, with too heavy a hand, they produce fairly bad resource misallocation in most places. Uh, so I would guess we don't want to do this forever, but I don't think this is necessarily on the brink of disaster. Uh, I would say it's more on the sovereign debt side. Uh, but it still makes people nervous. I mean, we haven't seen this very often. Uh, this is the sequence of quantitative easing. The composition is pretty interesting, and I'm going to answer your question. So I went and looked at the American economy because I was convinced that we were talking about structural problems and we didn't know what we were talking about. And so I'm going to show you a couple, some slides about what happened in the American economy. I, I, I've studied Germany and Italy in this respect, uh, and the patterns are similar. Not identical, but similar. 
So <clears throat> over uh, about 18 years, including in this case through the crisis, we did it up to the crisis and this runs to 2010, we looked at the American economy sector by sector from the point of view of tradable and non-tradable. Tradable means goods and services that can be produced in one country and consumed in another. And non-tradable is huge. Uh, it means you got to do it at home. So it's government, education, retail, uh, most of health, you know, restaurants, hospitality, da da da. You know, it's a very, very education. It's a very big part. It's two thirds of an, a typical uh, advanced economy is the non-tradable side. Now it's a moving target. The tradable side's getting bigger. Uh, for reasons you all know. You know, we can trade services now that we couldn't trade before. <clears throat> so this is employment. In the American economy in this period of time, the non-tradable sector generated all the employment. And the, and the tradable side actually lost. It generated essentially zero up to 2008. Uh, these numbers would be bigger in 2008 by 6 million. <laughs> There's a fair amount of job loss so it came after that. Uh, and these are, uh, the reds are, uh, you don't read this now, I'll just leave it behind. This is in detail um, what happened. So on the, on the non-tradable side, the economy generated a ton of income. Now remember, this is an economy that over time was increasingly running on debt, fueled excess domestic aggregate demand. So it's not surprising the non-tradable, and you know, there was a huge kick up from healthcare. This is a major problem in America. So when you stare at this graph for a while, you think, boy, that's not going to keep going <laughs> in that direction for very long. And then, then the non-tradable, the tradable, which is blue, generated real increases where you'd expect, consulting, designing computers, et cetera, you know, and then losses in the manufacturing sectors. And if you look inside the manufacturing sectors, you realize they're supply chains. They're value-added chains. They're long. They have lots of components. <clears throat> And so what, what disappeared are the lower value added components. Now it's a little more, so that's the globalization story. And so that disappearance, that's a lot of middle income jobs. You know, we're not talking about the people who manage multinational enterprise. We're not talking about the people who design the products. We're talking about the people who are making them, you know, and a few other things like that. And so when you net all those positive and negatives out, you get up with zero. With me so far? Okay. This is a value added. If you add up value added across industries, you end up with GDP. So this is growth, not the same pattern. Tradable generated actually a fair amount of growth, and the non-tradable side generated a fair amount. Remember, it's two-thirds, one-third, so the tradable side actually grew a little faster, in spite of the fact that there were no more people employed there. And so if you look at value added per person employed, per job, on these two sides, then the tradable side essentially generated growth and used it all up stuffing people in there who were not finding employment as the labor force increased in size on the, on the tradable side. And the tradable side didn't need anybody and kept generating more value, partly because they were moving up these value added chains, right? And so the tradable value added per person like this. What happened in the American economy? What happened in the American economy, one final um, graph. This is work that's been done at MIT and in other places. So these are people looking at kinds of jobs. And I'm saying this not because, some of this is idiosyncratic of the United States, but these are quite powerful forces that are affecting advanced economies everywhere. So I think it's of general interest. <clears throat> so they said, let's divide jobs into, in two ways. McKinsey two by two matrix. Cognitive and non-cognitive. You can think of is using your head or using your hands. And routine or not routine. Routine means there's an algorithm and a machine that could do the job. I mean, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but forgive me, okay? So this is a pattern in, that we see in the United States. This is non-routine cognitive. So that grows because that's the, what you associate with a high-end, you know, advanced economy. That's what grew in the tradable sector. This is non-routine manual. Who are these people? Well, they're working in restaurants or nursing homes with an aging population. They're doing a lot of things. 
uh, construction, you know, that we haven't figured out how to automate yet, and so on. <laughs> and these are all of the routine jobs, and they were sort of drifting down and not really contributing much. And then somewhere around 2000, there's a huge change. Now, even if these data don't measure these things perfectly, you get the pattern. So technology, it's not just globalization, technology is stripping out uh, routine jobs. So if you stand back from this, what you see is an economy that should have had an employment problem, overcame it with excess domestic aggregate demand, didn't shift over to the tradable side as much as it needed to, and even if it had, would have had the income distribution problem. It's just that we wouldn't have the shock and the unemployment problem, probably. And that is something that, that every country faces, and, and I took the graph out, but I can, there's startling differences across advanced countries in the pre- and post-tax in, income distributions. Your Gini coefficient is 33. America's is somewhere between 41 and 45. China's is up around 47. Germany's is 28. Uh, Brazil's used to be 60 and is whizzing down to 56. You'd think the place would blow up with measured income inequality of that size. We're, we're at the boundaries of what we actually know in economics. I do not believe these income distributions are the, purely the result of market forces. Now, I can't prove that, but I think there's a social sort of value overlay uh, that's different in different countries. But anyway, that's the story of the American economy. The rest is just late breaking news, is I figured this pattern that I just showed you would actually start to change in the, as the economy recovered in America. We're at about 2% real growth. And that's well below potential, but it's better than nothing. <laughs> and, and I thought, well, because we, we had this big negative demand shock and we have a fairly flexible economy, my hypothesis was that resources, labor and capital, would start moving toward the tradable sector because the tradable sector, by now I'm teaching you growth economics you didn't learn before. So the, the, the reason tradable and non-tradable is so important from the point of view of growth is that the tradable sector is complete, the non-tradable sector is completely de dependent on domestic demand, by definition. So if you have a negative demand shock, you're dead in the water until you've done whatever it takes to recover from that, deleverage, all that. The non-tradable side, that's not true. So if you become, this is familiar talk in Europe, right? It's familiar talk in Italy, although we're not doing it. If you become more uh, productive, there's a huge batch of demand out there for most economies that takes the, the demand constraint away. And it's really, if you're constrained on that side, it's because you're constrained in terms of productivity. So it's a completely different dynamic. So I figured the American economy, like many others uh, in Europe, had taken a big demand shock that killed off the non-tradable side, so the growth would start to be generated on the tradable side, because the economy's flexible and the resources can flow there. And then that would start to spill over backwards. Why? Because, forgive me, right, this is sort of like doing modeling verbally. Why? Because the demand side causes the spillover. You know, if I make computers or washing machines and get paid to do it, I don't go out and buy computers and washing machines. I might fix my house or go out to restaurants more or whatnot. So, and this is a caution for those of you who do, do this kind of thing. So it spills over fairly fast and starts to become an engine of growth in the non-tradable side as well. But it's a huge mistake to do growth accounting, okay? If you do growth accounting, what you'll see is, well, the tradable side's growing a bit, and then the non with not much of a lag, the non-tradable side starts to grow. So you think, well, they're both growing. What that misses is what the engine is, okay, the catalyst. And the, and the reason I think we can, we can learn to think this way is because of developing economies. Remember, you know, the domestic demand isn't big enough to drive growth in the developing economies. 
it's that big global demand and the rapid, explosive growth in the tradable sector that really drives this very high-speed growth that we see in the developing countries. And then, of course, it does spill back across on the demand side into the non-tradable side. So after your income gets to $1,000, you start spending on a little more interesting array of stuff. I think it all makes pretty good sense. But anyway, so the last statement is, so I now have the data on 2010, 2012, and lo and behold, that's where the growth occurred. It was in the tradable side, a very significant fraction of it. And the tradable side is now generating employment. Wonder of wonders. And that's what has to happen in a lot of our economies. The distressing thing about Italy is that our economy is, um, lacks important dimensions of flexibility especially on the labor side, but not exclusively. There's little monopolies all over the place. Now, I'm not a market <coughs> fundamentalist, but if you have barriers to this kind of structural adaptation, you're going to get into trouble fairly quickly in this world, because, but is it shifting around us so quickly? But that, so that's the story. What happened in America is, so I've, I guess I've tried to tell you a little bit about growth dynamics and why the crisis and the demand shock helps us understand these models better. But I'm also saying, basically, you're right. A combination of global and technological forces is turning the evolution of the economy into one in which the beneficiaries are, for most part, at the upper end of the education and income spectrum. And the, and the United States is an extreme case of that. Germany. <coughs> is uh, the, the Germany, of course, went through these major, major reforms in 2003 to 2006. It was, uh, a friend of mine said, the bad news was the economists called us the sick, sick man of Europe in 2000. The good news is we didn't read The Economist, <laughs> but, but we knew it anyway. And you know, they, it's very hard. Chancellor Schroeder lost his job getting that done. But that's an economy that had very little uh, built-in capacity to structurally adjust. And they knew that was a huge problem, uh, initially because Eastern Europe was going to be the place in an integrated European market where a lot of stuff went, and then, you know, the rest of the global economy following along. So they thought they'd better fix this, and what they did is remove those barriers, and what did they give back to labor? They gave back a promise of growth. They gave back a promise that it restrained income growth would be shared, okay? So that if, if flatlining wage and income growth was needed to get productivity back in line with incomes, it wouldn't happen just in the middle income range. And they've delivered on that. That's part of the reason the Gini coefficient is 0.28, or 0.28. Uh, and, and finally, and this I didn't learn until I actually asked Chancellor Schroeder, I said, and what else? And he said, well, the old social security system was we couldn't take your job away, we couldn't close the plant, and when we got the ability for firms to do that, we had to replace it with something. Labor told us clearly, you do this and there is no social security system and we're not going for it. So he said we had to rebuild the social security systems. And there's a huge, I think Europe's in the lead in many countries, you know, building social security systems that augment rather than hinder the dynamism of the economy, you know, unemployment insurance that focuses on employment, you know, the skills and training systems that you find in many countries are, I think, you know, important uh, data points and case studies that will be part of the kind of our collective learning how to live in a world that moves around us pretty fast. But still, we have this powerful adverse distributional effect, and I will... Germany there just for a second. Yep. I didn't touch on this really. You know, the, it's yeah. true that uh, the labor force in Germany, you know, the government suppressed labor by consensus that it was an yep. amazing achievement. But unfortunately, the European Central Bank then in the Eurozone dropped interest rates to effectively facilitate German restructuring, exported the savings to the periphery, and led to property bubbles in Spain and Ireland and so forth. And the normal monetary instruments that might be available for the were not available because we're all part of the Eurozone. That's right. So in other words, you had a monetary union without a fiscal union, 
and the periphery were literally defenseless in the onslaught. It's not like a football league where the horses will break the very terms. I've been trying to figure out a way of explaining this in terms in a nice way. <coughs> so we are almost there, but it is kind of scary, really, that the construction of the Eurozone was so defective from the beginning. And therefore, we're now talking about a banking crisis, but the genesis is at that period you're talking about. Well, it was. Yeah, well, first up, I mean, there's several things you've said, and I think they're all right. First, Germany's uh, sort of structural change and increase in competitiveness occurred in a much healthier global environment than everybody else is trying to do it in now. So that was just, you know, a big, big difference. Second, virtually all the central banks, you know, thought, well, we can leave the interest rates down if the inflation isn't there. And, you know, to be honest with you, China was a, just an enormously powerful force. It drove the relative price of an increasing body of manufactured stuff down uh, and helped contribute to an environment in which there wasn't inflation. And now everybody agree, realizes that was a mistake. And, yeah, and if you leave interest rates down for long enough, unless you have pretty powerful you know, restraints of another kind, regulatory, then you, then you build a defective growth model uh, that we've seen many variants of <laughs> in a lot of countries, and we shouldn't do it again. I, uh, by the way, I think this concept, not, when we were doing the Growth Commission work, Montek Alawalia, who's the deputy chairman of the plan, he runs the planning commission, the prime minister's the head of it. Very articulate guy, fellow Oxford grad, he said, is a lot of stuff, but he said, I think we should have a section called bad ideas, right? <laughs> you know, bad ideas are sort of the, the, the flip side. You know, we often talk about what works, right? This is what really, you know, doesn't work. So we had a section. There's only a couple of pages, or maybe three. It was 20 really bad ideas, you know, like subsidizing energy. is it was one of the worst ideas. It's also ubiquitous in the developing world. Uh, and very hard to stop politically once you get into it. Well, it was a smash hit. You know, I was getting emails pe from people all over the world, and they'd said, you know, I loved that section. You know, there were 20 items, and our government's doing 17 of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. <laughs> it was great. New uh, coefficients. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Like, I won't go on at great length. What, this is very hard data to collect on a comparable basis, and so don't over, don't over process it. But this is a picture for the OECD countries of labor share of national income, <coughs> wage income. And what you can see is, and is that, this is very small, I apologize, but after World War II, basically labor share rose till about the mid to late 70s, and then that turned around. This is just another aspect of, you asked such an interesting question. And then these powerful forces kicked in, and then it started the decline. Uh, profit share is volatile. Uh, government shares tend not to be so volatile. But there's something really quite fundamental going on, and it's not confined to a single country, uh, although the after-tax outcomes are, are somewhat different. Um, let me just flip back, because I maybe used up enough of your time. But I wanted to show you a couple other things. You, so, you saw this. The, the, I find this graph, uh, it's a little out of date, quite interesting. So that th this is basically total debt in relationship to GDP divided into its four major components. Sovereign debt, government debt, uh, financial sector debt, the rest of the private corporate sector debt, and household debt. And so you, I mean, I have this... I guess we all know this, but so the outliers are Japan and the United Kingdom, although they're busy working on it. Um, the outliers in public debt are, I mean, I apologize, Ireland isn't here. Um, the outliers in public debt would be, um, if I push that button, will the light go on or the whole thing will blow up? <laughs> what? Middle one oh, the middle one. Okay, cool. What middle one? Never mind. It doesn't matter. Um, the outliers in public debt uh, are Japan, which is just huge. I mean, this is impossible to understand how this is uh, and when you first look at it. And then, of course, Italy. And the, you're kind of in the same league, uh, a little bit below. But you'll come down faster than we can. 
Um, and, uh, and the saving grace in Italy is the household debt never got big. This is a country that, like China, doesn't use debt much. Uh, you know, 50% down payment on, I mean, cash into housing, stuff like that. And it's a very high saving country. So the per capita wealth, which is the accumulated savings, is relatively high in Italy. So it's not as bad as it looks. <coughs> I mean, it's a dysfunctional. I have, the, yeah, I have the privilege of living in two countries, both of which has a government that doesn't work. It's amazing. Um, now, uh, so we're going to have to struggle our way out of this. Uh, my, let me tell you my own sort of amateurish view on the Eurozone. Everybody knows it's a flawed structure. But, but so let me tell a story from a growth point of view. So any sensible market fundamentalists, you know, there, there was a, in development, there was a thing called the Washington Consensus. It was put together by a guy named John Williamson. Very smart man, very sensible list of things. The problem was, especially in Latin America, they took John Williams' sensible set of things that you probably ought to do if you want to grow at 6 or 7%, stripped it down. This is the market fundamentalism. And then sort of applied it as if it's a formula. There's nothing formulaic about this at all. We know something about the necessary con conditions for growth. We, only the most arrogant would say we know the sufficient conditions. We just don't. And so this is, it's more a matter of fumbling around and experimenting and finding the solutions. But that was, anyway, that was sort of market fundamentalism in that form. That model is wrong. And the model where government does everything and kind of fills in all gaps is wrong too. Arthur Lewis who's a Nobel Prize winner in, in development economics, Jamaican, said it best. He said, you can have a government that's too big and you can have a government that's too small. <laughs> and, what, and what you want is an effective government that actually gets stuff done and, is, and, and is, navigates well. That is, you know, figures out how to move. And <clears throat> if you accept those two sort of features of the growth model, then you've got a pretty good idea of sort of what direction, you know, what, what, the, what, the, what the overall model is. I mean, how, how you do this. And you have to make judgments, which we're very reluctant to make. So, uh, and I think this is the worst problem on, in, in America, particularly. So in the business world, you live in a world of uncertainty. You know, there's positives and benefits. You can, a statistician would say type one and type two errors from doing anything, right? And, and so you, make, you take your best shot at it, and if you get it wrong, you stop doing it and do something else. In the policy world, there's a very big asymmetry. In, 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 in environments where there's a, there's a, a kind of underlying current of respect for markets that I think we're only getting over now, excess respect. And that is, if you want to argue for intervention in many places, you have to argue in a pretty ironclad way that it's needed. Otherwise, the presumption is that it's fine. And that's part of what I believe got us into trouble. Instead of looking at it and saying, well, we didn't have this structure before, maybe we're blowing the thing up. Let's listen to everybody on this and make our best judgment. We assumed, Alan Greenspan assumed, I mean, I'm not making stuff up. They say they assumed that unless somebody produced a pretty tight argument that there was something wrong here, markets didn't make mistakes. Very bad idea. Okay, so now let's take the China case. So Deng Xiaoping gets up one morning, having survived the Cultural Revolution and the Gang of Four, and, and removed his predecessor, a man named Hua, and said, well, this isn't working very well. Uh, why don't we try something else? Let's call it the socialist market economy. Uh, and first thing we'll do is we'll have just a little, we'll tiptoe into market incentives by allowing, in certain areas, farmers or collectives that produce above the quota to sell the difference on the open market. Agricultural output exploded. 
That's a good use of economics. Incentives really matter. What he didn't do is say, well, we're over-investing a bit much here, and we've got an overheated economy. We'll get the central bank to raise the interest rates. I mean, I could put this crudely, but nobody in China gave a hoot about what the interest rate was. None of the investment decisions were based on that. Okay? So they made practical, sensible judgments that had to do with the institutional depth of the economy on both the market side and the government and regulatory side that change continuously over time. They now do use interest rates along with administrative controls, and they do have a in-process financial sector that still got a long way to go to be the kind of thing you're used to uh, in the advanced countries or in any one of our countries. Uh, and the great skill is the ability to bring really smart people together, let them argue and navigate in that kind of environment. It's a kind of meta skill. Let me give you other examples. I lived in Silicon Valley for you know, almost 20 years. There are lots of clusters in the world of excellence in various things, but a subset of them come and go as the kind of you know, environment changes. And a few of them reinvent themselves. So Silicon Valley has reinvented itself. I'm not singling it out as, as unique in this respect at all, but it's reinvented itself at least four times in my lifetime. And seems now that you know, maybe it'll lose this ability all of a sudden. But this is an imp important. I think of this as similar to the policy you know, navigation skills. This is the ability to bring in new talent, have new ideas, be open, you know, and learn. If I leave you with nothing today, it's this proposition. We are living with non-cyclical change, right? We are going to take this journey together on the planet once. China will become a massively large economy once, affecting you know, everybody in sight, including the rest of the developing world, and so on and so on. You, you have to have an ability to think about things that aren't repetitive, right? That aren't static, and so on, to navigate successfully in this environment. And one of the lessons, I think, of the developing countries is that over time, they, the successful ones have learned how to do that, a growing number have learned how to do that, among other things. Uh, there's not much more I can add to this. Uh, I, I, this is Brazil. A friend of mine who was on the Growth Commission, Edmar Basha, put, uh, there's two things I wanted to say, I'm hopping around, but there's two things I wanted to say about this, just to emphasize a point. Brazil is doing many things right, but Brazil's investment rate is 18.7%. There is no way on earth that you can sustain six or six, five, six percent growth on an investment rate that low. It has to be closer to 25 plus, right? Edmar would agree with that, I'm not telling you. And it's low even in sort of Latin America, except for Bolivia and Paraguay. Uh, so now Brazil has a very big problem with inclusiveness, which is a crucial dimension of growth. You, you, the growth commissioners, if they were in this room with us, would say, <coughs> Inclusiveness meaning equity in a variety of forms, ex ante, ex post, protecting people, and so on, isn't a nice add-on. It's an inherent part of a growth strategy. If something goes wrong in that, something will go wrong somewhere else, and it's usually political. It can be violence. Uh, it can be a lot of things. Uh, so Brazil's working away on that, and, and the evidence of that is this is for the last 10 years. This is, these are the deciles of the income distribution. And this is the growth rate of income in those deciles. And you see what they're doing? Income growth is highest in the poorest, next highest in the next poorest, right? And so on and down. They're solving over time. This will take them many years. Uh, they're solving the problem of including everybody in the economy. I mean, you know Brazil. This is an economy that had a dual structure. It was an, an, <coughs> excuse me, an advanced economy and an economy of people who lived in tin cans on the sides of hills for historical reasons, right? Uh, <coughs> and now they're kind of integrating that, and that uses up a lot of resources or government capacity, and so maybe it's natural 
that they're under-investing, and maybe they've even made a rational choice. Maybe you can't do everything at once. Uh, so when I say that, I don't mean it's a no-brainer they should do something else, but I show it to you anyway. Just in relation to China on the same thing, because, uh, you know, the, you're, as we're fortunate, you know so much about China, because, uh, you know, a lot of people comment and they don't really, are not familiar with the, they, don't have, they, haven't, uh, they haven't got their hands dirty, so to speak, by China. But just the current <laughs> model on China, you know, it's been very one much investment-driven, you know, in the sense of, and it's a huge credit bubble now. And they've got to make a really difficult transition. And uh, yep. you mentioned inclusiveness, because uh, I have to say I was hugely uh, affected by that book, Why Nations Fail. Yeah. I really read it. But you know the yeah. thing about Nogales, half Nogales is in the U.S., and the other half is in Mexico. And they make the argument, as you've just said, yep. you know, inclusive political and economic institutions are really critical to, to explain why the bit in the US has got three times the income, lower crime, and uh, you know, better opportunities for yep. its citizens. So yep. this question about China, and uh, Wen Jibao, the previous prime minister, who I have to say was a very great admirer of, because he kept going on about the need for political reform, i.e. inclusive political and economic institutions to cross the Rubicon. Now, of course, his interpretation, what he actually said, and mine might be different, but that's another story. But I sort of put that to you about the challenge China faced in that context and how you think it's going to address it based on what you just said. And we might come to a, to a conclusion with that. Well, it's perfect, because the last thing I was going to try to show you before you all actually go do something productive, <coughs> other than listen, I mean, we, and that doesn't include listening to me. <clears throat> so China is in the middle of the middle income transition. This is frequently called a trap. I don't call it a trap because you can get out of it. But not many do. So this is a sample of high growth, relatively high growth countries <coughs> coming into the middle income range, which is 3,000 and above dollars. And most countries slow down or stop. So there's massive changes associated with that transition. And the, the, the blue line is Taiwan, the Taiwanese economy, the red line, South Korea. The other high-speed transitions were Japan and the city states, Hong Kong and Singapore. And that's it, as far as I know. There may be others if you hunt hard enough. <coughs> so there's a very complex set of things that I've been involved in, you know, that go along with this transition. Uh, reliance on consumption and the domestic economy rather than just exports and a huge levels of investment. China's, China's big risk, well, they maxed out on the tradable side. It's the opposite. It's the flip side. We maxed out, a Morton maxed out on the domestic demand in many countries. They maxed out on the tradable side and ignored this. But this, this, this one graph will tell you, and then I'll answer your question. Um, oops. Here, here is household disposable income trending down from 70 to 60. It's now under 60. Now I need to supply you with a couple of other facts. The household savings rate is 30%. So most people's estimates, that is that consumption in, in consu household consumption is well under 40% of GDP. <coughs> and then you hear the pundits say, this is an economy that's going to be driven by domestic household consumption, right? Explosive growth. Well, it is, but there's some things that have to happen, and this is not one of them, right? So these are fairly complex demand management sides, income demand management sides of the, of the Chinese economy that they have to get their arms around. We don't have time to sort of go through it all, <coughs> but it's crucial, that side of it. The rest of it is get rid of low return investment and whatnot. Don't, you know, use the leverage model that we used, so they're reining that in. Don't have a shadow, your version of a shadow banking sector that's unregulated. They're busy kind of getting that under control. Uh, the bad news is, you know, there's always, you know, some potential instability, and the good news is that they move pretty fast. They get a hold of it. Now, I not only read that book, I kind of commented it on the cover. <laughs> I think it's a wonderful book, and I think Darren Asimoglu is one of the leading, you know, political economy uh, people in the world, and that it's, that it's on a short list of some of the more important subjects. You can't understand this growth <coughs> without the political economy component, the, the, the political side, the leadership, the constraints that come from the political side are important. <coughs> Having said that, you could read that book and make the following mistake. 
Suppose again we have the McKinsey two by two matrix and we put on one side lousy economic performance and, and this is excellent economic performance. And over here we put democracy and here we put pretty autocratic. <laughs> you can fill in all the boxes, easily fill in all the boxes. They're, the worst performing things are autocratic things where you know they're not even interested in the well-being of the people. There's hundred, not hundreds, but tens and tens of failing democracies especially in the lower income categories. And there's high performing democracies <coughs> like India in the developing world and there's high performing democracies in the advanced world and then there's China and a bunch of others. If you look carefully, um, Korea, Taiwan and Japan all had the form of a democracy but had a dominant single party and the political system was rigged for about 30 years of growth <clears throat> and then they evolved. But actually, they made changes on purpose to turn it into a multi-party democracy because that's what the people wanted. And in one form or another, that'll probably happen in China. But, but if you really want to understand growth, you can't do it by the form of governance. Or you could, if that were true, you couldn't fill in the two-by-two two matrix. So what it tells you is you've got to look for something else. And the something else has to do with it, not only capability and not making stupid mistakes, but it has to do with your objective function. And that's where leadership comes in. And an autocratic system can be benign. In fact, what China got out of the communist revolution wasn't excellent economic policy. It was a commitment to make everybody over time better off. Now, they just didn't do a very good job of it for the first 29 years, but that is embedded in that. One of the reasons the Communist Party still enjoys a fair amount of support is because people understand that's a commitment. And if they lose it, it'll be because of corruption or losing track of that fact or rising inequality or all the other challenges that they, they've got to face. I, a surprising number of people have never been to China, including academics who write about it and, and assume that you know that system I mean, I wouldn't, I'd be the last person to argue that that form, that structure, will last forever. In fact, it's evolving. You know, it's a very peculiar form of evolution because the, the democratic elements are inside this big umbrella called the party. Um, but there is, you have to take it a bit with a grain of salt, which is A, pay attention to the data, and B, Maybe there's another way. There's a really interesting discussion going on about the role of the state in China. So a part of it's ideological, you know, literally Maoist. Uh, but part of it is they, they look at us and they say, the part of the model we like is the microeconomic part, the dynamism, the innovation, the stuff. We want that. And then they look at our macroeconomic configurations and they say, do we want that balance sheet? They think, well, maybe not. Now, the, China had, the, the state in China has an unbelievable balance sheet. They own the state-owned enterprises, which are, let's call it 40% of the market side of the economy. They have $3.5 trillion of reserves, which are about to go down in value, thanks to policy decisions <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> and, and they got <clears throat> land and stuff like that. There's, so they have these resources. <clears throat> but if they decide that's a good balance sheet because it gives you, you know, a buffer from shocks internal and externally administered and a bunch of other stuff, then you've got to manage those assets well. And it's pretty clear to the reformers that there's a way to manage those assets that interferes with the dynamism and, and ultimately innovativeness of the economy. And there's a way to manage them that, that is much more benign with respect to that. And there, that's actually probably the most important pitched battle that's going on right now. And, and, and the issue is what to do with the state-owned enterprises. Okay. Thanks a lot, everybody. It was fun Thank to be you. with you. Yeah.